Okay, hi guys, welcome to Biology Online with Annie from Theatre. Okay, hello Year 12s. Yep, yeah, we have to go further with our unit and also we need to look at things that actually affect how the genotype and the phenotype get together. Because sometimes, we, well up until now, we've just been talking about the genotype dictating what happens to the phenotype. In other words, how something looks. But another thing that can have a huge impact on how you look is your environment. What about something like somebody who gets a burn scar or anything like that? So without further ado, here we go. All right, so here's some environmental effects. If you look at Michael Jackson, over here he was 13 years old and over here he was 50 just before he died. Can you see the amazing transformation that he went through? Now, this is definitely artificial because he went through a lot of skin treatments and a lot of um, plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, but yeah, that is definitely... This is not what his genes intended him to look like. Okay, definitely not. Over here, we have two identical twins. These guys were from Australia. Unfortunately, the one has um, passed away. He was killed by the police. But I thought it's a brilliant example of how twins, they were identical when they were little, but as they get older and older, due to environmental effects, how they have more and more look different. Now, okay, you say, but this is all artificial, so it's not natural. How can the nature and the environment actually have an effect on the phenotype? It's more the DNA, isn't it? But have a look at this tree. Okay, these are trees in New Zealand. And they obviously grow in an area where it's very, very windy. Now, if you look at the rest of the grass and so on, it's, this is not a windy day. They actually grew this way because the wind is prevailing in that direction. Okay? Not in their DNA. They would not choose to grow like this. But the wind forced them to be like this. Something else. Does anybody ever use bonsai? Um, or work on bonsai? Or know people who have bonsai, little bonsai trees? Uh, it's an amazing art form. And um, takes a lot of patience. Bonsai trees, basically, you put them in a small container. You constantly cut their roots. You cut their... their um, growth and you you shape them and you form them um, and that is not obviously what their genes want them to do their genes want them to grow big another example would be those you can buy these plants with the the stems look all like what's the word for it like plaiting um, again that is environmental effects how people make it into this but this is 100% natural okay so just want to remind you about this, the regulating of an en enzyme production. Now, genes can be turned on and off when they need to. Okay, They are not always being expressed. And the way that we turn them on and off is with the promoter region. The promoter region will actually, um, don't know if it changes, I personally don't understand it, but I just know that the promoter region turns the gene on versus off and get, gets it ready for transcription. It's a little bit more than just the start codon. Okay? The start codon is definitely part of that, but the promoter region can also turn it on and off. Now, um, that's how our lactase my mutation works. Um, if you have lactase persistence, in other words, you're a mutant that can drink milk in adulthood, so everybody who is lactose, lactose intolerant they actually do not have the mutation. Um, and that mutation is in the promoter region of the gene. It's not in the gene itself. It's the genes never turned off after childhood. And that is because of the promoter region. And then the, you also have the terminator region. And then the coding region. Obviously, you have the coding and the template strands. Now, this promoter region is the one that regulates the enzyme. And it's going to be regulating it based on the environment. Um, so sometimes genes need to be induced, so only when they are needed to be made. Um, other constituent genes are being transcribed all the time because their product is in constant demand. So some of our genes are always made, um, so respiratory enzymes and so forth. So 
we know whoopsie, that we have the DNA, it goes through transcription, and with transcription, if you turn the promoter region on or off, transcription is turned on or off, which means the amount of enzyme is regulated. So by regulating transcription, we are regulating the enzyme. So genes in the environment, um, these are all calves that have been cloned. They have identical DNA to each other. But when you look at them, even though they have identical DNA to each other, all of them are slightly different, and the patterning can be slightly different. There's a white area there that doesn't occur here. Um, this one has got a, a black leg. Um, this one's leg extends, the black extends to the side. This one is a band. How is that possible? And it's all because of environmental factors. Okay, so act, the environmental factors act on an organism to produce a unique phenotype. Now, before um, Darwin, now I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a belief that if your dad stretched his neck every day, then you will be born with a longer neck. That is kind of like saying, well, if your mom has a scar where her appendix was taken out, then you're going to be born with that scar. Or if Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was um, doing a lot of bodybuilding, if he had a child, then his child will come out a bodybuilder. And that is obviously not how it works. Okay, so our genotype provides the genetic potential. So that's the possible phenotype. And the environment shapes it. Okay. So when you look at these little plants, for instance, um, <coughs> mycorrhizae, or mycorrhizae, I think we pronounce it mycorrhizae, um, they are nitrogen-binding microorganisms that live on the plants on their s in, in their roots. And they actually help to catch the nitrogen out of the atmosphere and give that nitrogen to the plants to help them to grow. Now, these guys are over here, they're growing in sterile soil. So there's no nitrogen binding organisms called mycorrhizae. And can you see how the big difference is? But they both have the same DNA. So obviously the environment has an effect to it. So things like wind exposure, water availability, light, temperature, soil type, pH, nutrition, predation, symbiotic associations, chemical factors, and so forth. Some other factors might also include things like hormone levels during development. Okay, and sometimes we also speak about epigenetics in this case. There's a great study uh, during the Second World War in Holland, there was a bunch of ladies who were pregnant, and because they were so malnourished, they had very, very little to eat during the Second World War. Their babies came out really, really tiny. And that is directly associated with their... Um, um, not their DNA, but because of the environmental conditions. And the weirdest thing is, those small children then went on to have kids. And they will probably be the age of my parents at this stage, because my parents were born close to the Second World War. And they had children, and that those small kids, because of the war, had small kids again which just blows my mind. And it shows you that one uh, environmental effect on these children then produced smaller offspring for along for many generations, which, yeah, amazing. Okay, so your sources of genetic variation, we know, is because of dominant alleles, recessive alleles, mutation, crossing over, independent assortment, and gene interactions. But over here you can see the environment plays a huge role. Okay. Very interesting. Um, some crocodiles and turtles um, depend on the temperature that you actually incubate the egg at. Determines the gender of the animal. It blows my mind. So the gender of some animals is determined by the temperature at which they are incubated during the embryonic e development. Examples include American alli alligators, crocodiles, and turtles. So high incubation temperatures produces males, and low incubation periods produces females. 
in other species the opposite is true. So yeah, what's going to happen if we have further climate change? Are we suddenly going to have a single gender crocodile species? And what's going to happen then? It's really something to consider. Uh, we've talked about these rabbits and the cats before, but it's called color pointing. Okay, And these rabbits and cats, some of you went skiing over the holidays. And which part of your body is the coldest? Your ears your nose, your fingers, and your toes. And if you had a long tail, it would have been your tail. So when we look at these animals, let me just get a pointer. When we look at these animals, we can see it's kind of a trade-off. They want to be well camouflaged, and these are Himalayan rabbits. They want to be well camouflaged, but their extremities are really susceptible to the cold. And if it is a black in color, it will absorb more light energy, in other words, more heat. The interesting thing about the Siamese cats, when the babies are born, they're actually born completely white. But as they leave the nest, or the den, I don't know what you call a cat's lair, <laughs> um, the temperature of their extremities actually drop. And as the temperature drops, they then develop this color patterning. And it's all because the pigment production, pigment production is controlled by a gene. And is controlled by a temperature sensitive enzyme. And it, only the extremities are cool enough to allow the enzyme to function. I want to probably say cold enough, not cool enough, but yeah. Okay, so I find that really, really interesting. Altitude. Um, definitely an effect. If you drive up Ruapayo or you're going up Queenstown, the landscape changes, the plant growth changes, the, the plants become shorter and shorter. Um, you might have exactly the same tree growing at the bottom versus at the top, but at the top it will be look a lot different. Okay, Because of temperature, water availability, low oxygen um, in the atmosphere, low carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if it's plants and so forth. So altitude is another one that has an effect. The effect of predation. <laughs> Again, this to me, I love this. Um, <coughs> there's a microorganism called um, Daphnia. Okay? And Daphnia swims around and then suddenly a midge larva. So a midge is kind of like a, almost like a mosquito or a, more like a sand fly, they lay their eggs in the same water that these guys live in. And when that lava is there, our friends Daphnia suddenly grow a spike on its head. And because it has the spike on its head, the lava has trouble eating it and controlling it. It's just so cool. It's like, you know what, you're not going to eat me, I'll just grow a spike and stick into your upper palate or something. I love that. Um, here's an actual, I got a bit into this, so sorry. Here's a scanning electron micrograph where you can see the non-helmeted form and the helmeted form. They almost look like, I don't know, a male and a female pair that's going to go for a dance or something. But no, it's just this one was found where it was the larvae eating them and this one not. And this is obviously a light microscope. You can see the light is coming through it and the helmeted form over there and even some extra spikes. Uh, I thought, I thought that was awesome. And you know what? The other day I found this in my own house. Yeah, check it out. Okay, that's not my daughter. But it does happen in humans. I wonder who the predator was. Hopefully only a friendly predator. Like a dinosaur. Anyways, here's one for you. Um, these fish are called ras. W-R-A-S-S-E. -S -S okay, parrotfish. We actually get them in the hierarchy Gulf as well. And um, <coughs> just like guppies, um, these, well, well, let me start off by saying that normally you will have one male and a bunch of females, okay? Um, and these fish live in a large group consisting of a single male with attendant females and juveniles. Okay, so they're kind of in a school, only one male, bunch of females, and then kids. Now... 
When that male dies, there's suddenly no male. So what happens is the strongest female, the dominant female, literally tr changes her gender to become a male. So, in other words, she grows the gonads, she grows the testicles, she... It's just, wow. Um, the same happens with guppies. If you have guppies in your tank, and it's only a bunch of females, one of them will, the, s the dominant one will turn into a male, so that they can continue. Uh, yeah, it's really, really cool. What about the sun, and the effect of that on plants and animals? This lady had, she was trying to photosynthesize, I imagine. But, human skin will become darker when exposed to direct sunlight over a period of time. And the reason why we become dark, darker is to provide us with more protection from the dangerous UVA and UVB. And the way that we do that is with the production of pigment again, and that pigment is called melanin. Plants will actually grow towards the light. You will see this with some of your indoor plants. <coughs> um, if you have them at a window, you have to turn them every now and again because they will always grow towards the window. Sunflowers actually follow the sun every day. And all of that is done through the, well, plants in this case is growth, and with the sunflowers that's with water pressure in their large vacuoles, but all of that is controlled by enzymes. And the enzymes in turn are stimulated by the light. Okay, so another environmental effect. Over here is pH, I don't know if any of you know hydrangeas. Hydrangeas are, um, are beautiful flowers. Um, they are coming back into fashion, kind of. People plant them more, but when I was little, there was a lot of them around. Very interesting. If you take this same plant, you don't even transplant it. You simply have acidic soil, okay? The, an acidic soil with a pH is like five to five and a half. The flowers are blue. And then if you take like blood and bone or some other kind of base and you work it into the ground close to where the roots are and the soil then becomes less acidic, the flowers become pink. So here's maybe an overshare. When I was little, my grandmother used to tell us to always go and, come on boys, go be on the hydrangeas, please, because we want the a the the... the, the acid in your urine to make the soil nice and low so we can have blue flowers. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, it was different times and a different continent, so get over it. So the color is due to the presence of aluminium um, compounds in the flower and the aluminium is more readily available when the soil pH is low. Okay, but yet again, pH has a definite effect on the phenotype. This was a very sad story. Um, the few years before I was born, this was in the 60s, um, there was a drug on the, on the market called thalidomide. And thalidomide was specifically prescribed for um, moms who had morning sickness. So they were given thalidomide to actually help them not to get morning sickness. And unfortunately what happened is a lot of kids were born because of this thalidomide with limbs that were missing and short, very strange limb formation. Um, if you see people that probably at the moment in the age of about late 50s um, to middle 60s, you frequently see people with these thalidomide extremities. So they would have a small, I don't know, paddle of an arm and stuff like that. One of my friends had it. Um, he didn't have a hand. Uh, very sad. Another thing that's really sad is fetal alcohol syndrome. If a lady is pregnant and she consumes too much alcohol, um, that can definitely affect the child, and specifically the brain development. A teratogen is harmful chemical to a, a unborn child. <coughs> I don't know if any of you um, remember that uh, or has ever have exposure to Roaccutane, which is a drug that you drink when you have bad acne. Now, I used to, when I was a pharmaceutical representative, I used to sell um, this drug, Roaccutane, and the active ingredient in there is called isotretinoin, and 
that isotope to know and if the girl, if she's drinking this for her acne and she actually falls pregnant, the child is severely um, deformed and usually don't live very long um, if, if they make it to full pregnancy. So with every prescription that we gave out, we actually printed a contract and if it was a girl, she had to she had to sign a contract that she would not fall pregnant. And frequently the doctors would put them on um, the pill as well. Um, so the contraceptive pill, so that they don't fall pregnant. And unfortunately what happened a few times um, was that the girl would fall pregnant, um, abortions were not legal, so she would drink these pills to try and abort the fetus. Um, yeah. So, a great pill for acne, but really have to look after, make sure that you don't fall pregnant. So that's something else. Okay. And then we get back to mutations, which we've already done. And guess what? That is the end of our unit. So, from here on in, we're going to do um, past papers and practice answering these questions so that we know what we can expect. All right. We have uh, another week or so left to get through all of these um, so that we are well prepared. Don't forget, you can also start reviewing uh, the other units because with our practice exams coming up, you're going to write not only about um, gene expression, but you are going to write about um, life process at the cellular level and also you're going to write about genetic variation and change. Okay, guys. So um, I hope you found this informative and I will chat to you again soon. Thank you so much. Keep well.